Right. Let me welcome everyone uh, to the June seminar of the British Institute of Persian Studies. Uh, this talk is going to be by uh, Dr. Lindsay uh, Allen. Dr. Allen is a lecturer in Greek and Near Eastern History at King's College here in London. She's previously held research fellowships at Wolfham College, Oxford, the Warburg Institute, and also the British Museum. Um, and she was a visiting scholar at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World in New York, and she has been at King's since 2005. Dr. Allen's research and teaching interests lie mostly in the Near East, particularly the Achaemenid Persian Empire period from 550 to 330 BC and pre-Islamic Iran. Her research has expanded from Achaemenid kingships, kingships in texts and material culture, now to include the history of scholarship and reception studies, particularly in relation to Persian history, the ancient Near East, and Alexander of Macedon. Her most recent publications include Eminence Gris, Emergent Antiquities in 17th Century Iran, uh, in, in a book called uh, Afterlives of Ancient Rock-Cut Monuments in the Near East out of Brill, and before that, The Greatest Enterprise, Arthur, Arthur Upham Pope, Persepolis and Achaemenid Antiquities, uh, published in a volume uh, doc, edited by the same Dr. Kadoy, uh, entitled Arthur Upham Pope and a New Survey of Persian Art. Dr. Allen was uh, elected a member of the British Governing Council late last year in her lecture today on a committed royal audience in Lake Qajar Media follows in the tradition of recently elected members delivering a talk that highlights their scholarly research. Scholarly research. So Dr. Allen, off you go. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, um, so I want to start by giving you um, an account of why I dared to attempt this paper um, because I am not, as many people I, uh, who are listening to this presentation are aware, um, I am not an expert in the Qajar period or in Qajar decorative arts at all. Um, and I'm starting off with very much a very Achaemenid um, image uh, to kind of introduce you to my research. There are two pathways of my research on which I've worked for quite a few years, which have converged on this topic. Um, and the paper I want to give you today is, um, is partly work in progress. I'm going to try to give you today um, a, uh, a sort of evidential exploration uh, and, some, and some sort of theoretical ideas, some framing um, and some preliminary conclusions. Um, and um, that is something that I'm, I, I think I'm sparing you my more wacky ideas in this particular version of this paper. Uh, but if anybody would like to ask the wacky questions afterwards, please go ahead. Um, I, so as I've said, I've worked on this for some years. Um, my original um, PhD topic with Amelie Kurt was on the ideology of Achaemenid kingship, or rather the ideology of kingship in a sort of multicultural sense within the Achaemenid Empire. So I was interested in, both, interested in both the broadcast and the reception of ideas of kingship. After completing that PhD, I published part of it um, in an article on the reception and appropriation of the Achaemenid audience scene in the imperial provinces, and that was back in 2007. Um, and then, although of course it's far from being the last word on the subject. Um, so part of what I'm going to talk about today is, um, is related to that. Second, for well over 10 years now, I've been working on a worldwide census and study of the fragments taken from the site of Persepolis, um, roughly between 1700 and the mid 20th century. And part of the work I've done on that um, is related to um, thinking about the context for reception and the context for the construction of ideas about um, the ruin. Since that effectively powers some of the physical engagement and the destructive physical engagement with the ruin over time. So both of these topics have brought me to thinking about um, the construction of um, kingship using images from uh, Persepolis in the late 19th century. Um, and uh, I, this is what I want to concentrate on today. Before I um, go back and go on to the 19th century, I do want to kick off with a couple of images of the Achaemenid royal audience. Uh, the opening slide showed the kind of classic monumental Achaemenid audience scene um, worked up at Persepolis on two, on two more than life-size orthostats 
uh, that form the center of a converging imperial uh, population on the north and east facades of the columned hall, the major columned hall, the Apadana at Persepolis. Um, and that image itself appropriated the presentation of the king from earlier Neo-Assyrian reliefs and wall paintings, retooled for an Achaemenid context. One of the things that happens within the Achaemenid context is that the audience scene uh, becomes um, more, slightly more abstracted and more adaptable um, in multiple cultural contexts. And what we find is that commissioners of seals and monuments themselves further adjusted this scene for their own purposes, copying, exerting, restyling, collaging um, for their own particular functions. And those functions could include not just signaling allegiance or enrollment in the hierarchy, uh, but also subversion and satire of it. Um, and see the um, article for, for more details. So in sum, the audience scene is an imaginary space for the construction of subjects' relationships to the king, and it's subject to condensation, uh, condensing, uh, transcultural citation, appropriation, subversion, all of those different things. Uh, although the over life size treasury reliefs um, of the early fifth, late sixth, early fifth century BCE are the ones best known um, via their position now at Persepolis. Um, so I don't know if you can, I think maybe you can see my cursor possibly here. Um, this one here is still at the site. Everybody might be familiar with that from the site. Um, and this one here is um, now removed to the National Museum in Tehran. So those two um, very visible um, monumental audience scenes are the most familiar now, um, but they um, were not visible until the 20th century. So for images of the accumulated audience scene in situ at Persepolis, we are not thinking about these giant sort of human size ground level encounters um, with the accumulated king in kind of uh, this um, prominent isolation. Instead, um, visitors to the site and readers, viewers, receivers of images of the site encountered the enthroned king in slightly more isolated or condensed contexts um, in the throne jam, uh, in the door jams of the Hundred Columns Hall or the central building at Persepolis. So there are two structures with door jams showing the enthroned king in a greater or lesser degree of uh, sociability um, enthroned on a platform um, held up by a series of figures. Depending on which building you're in, whether it's at the front of the Hundred Columned Hall um, or at the back of the Hundred Columned Hall and at the side of the central building, you are seeing the um, Persian king um, supported by uh, rows and rows of guards at the front of the Hundred Columned Hall or um, by imperial subjects. So the one on the left here is showing you supported by imperial subjects and on the right elevated above rows and rows of uh, guards. Um, this iconography significant, significantly influenced literary visualizations of legendary Iranian kings in the med medieval period, notably Jamshid. Um, and it's a imagery also reflected in, not completely duplicated in, but reflected in the iconography of the royal tombs nearby at Naqshirustam and in the Kurrahmat over Persepolis too. Um, these images are those used to accompany Zara's survey of ancient monuments issued in the in 1900 to 1901. And these copies, I'm very grateful. I was able to look at the um, sort of giant blown up versions at the V&A, um, but I believe they're also readily available as duplicate um, Severgin um, uh, photographs too. So the association between um, let me just move this, sorry. Uh, between the enthroned Persepolitan king and the legendary Jamshid, sort of exemplified by the stable nomenclature of the site as Tahta Jamshid, continued in the 19th century iconography of Jamshid in literary manuscripts and publications. The Jamshid of these illustrations is recognizably derived from visualizations of the Achaemenid king at Persepolis via copies of that relief iconography, 
but it's been condensed, restyled and integrated into his legendary court. And here I want to highlight and acknowledge Adept to the really great essay on this um, type of lithographic production by Fadshid M. Ami in the 2017 catalogue to the exhibition Technologies of the Image. And this is from the catalogue edited uh, by Roxburgh and McWilliams. These visualizations of Jamshid are dated 1868 from the right, 1901 and Nine, uh, late 19th century for the manuscript on the left. So we should all set out before we start thinking about the Achaemenid enthronement in the 19th century, recognizing that one of the most dominant inflections or translations of the Achaemenid image uh, was already of um, the antiquity into the world of the Shahnameh, um, into the world of pre-Islamic Iran as visualized in poetry and prose histories of uh, the nation. Oops. Now the body of material I want to discuss today is, is harder to contextualize I think than pre print or architectural varieties um, and the additional problem for me I think is that what I'm dealing with here is um, circulating objects, that is mobile carpets which have a sort of commercial and um, usable um, uh, um, a commercial multi-purpose um, sort of uh, existence. Um, only two or three of the carpets I'm aware of and that I'm going to talk about today are in stable museum contexts. The one on the left is associated uh, with Abdul Hussein Mirza the Farm and Farmer and dated to 1893 to 4 and in the Tehran Carpet Museum. And I'm conscious here I haven't visited the Tehran Carpet Museum for some decades sadly and um, I, I have a feeling that some of the depth of this context is missing so far and I, I, I hope to reach out and, and learn more um, using their um, collections and using collaboration in the future. So we have the farm and farmer um, uh, one on the left, uh, sorry on the right, <laughs> I'm getting this, these mixed, uh, mixed up, um, and the second um, is inscribed with the name of the maker Abol Ghassam Kermani and dated to 1887. So one, sorry, the farm and farmer one is in, at St. Petersburg in the Hermitage, uh, the um, uh, Abdul Ga Abol Ghassam Kermani one is in the Tehran um, Carpet Museum. For further examples of these then I'm going to have to reach out into archived, archived examples preserved via magazine articles or auction catalogues, which would not be my normally my choice of sort of evidential discussion. And in addition, I want to refer to a couple of pieces, pieces recently offered or currently held by dealers in carpets as well. As part of the context for those pieces, I do want to acknowledge the fact that there's actually a much broader set of iconography appearing in textiles and particularly in carpet production of the late 19th and early 20th century, reaching right through from the 1890s through to the sort of 19, 1930s or so, uh, of which you see a selection here. The one in the top right is perhaps the one uh, closest to Abul Ghassam Kermani in style and is in the Moscow um, uh, Museum of Oriental art, uh, showing a version of the Bizitun monument. Um, and there are others, including um, one known as the Chicago Persepolis carpet, um, showing a sort of compilation, an antiquarian annotated compilation of elements of Persepolis, all in a kind of giant um, interactive spread. Um, and also, one also finds um, 19th century views of um, particularly the Palace of Darius, the one in the centre here is something that I photographed recently offered at an auction house in London, um, being reproduced in what we tend to call what is conventionally called Four Seasons Carpets um, as one of the several national monuments of Iran. And there are also other iconographic borrowings from the monuments at Persepolis, including as a sort of majority production by Khashkai tribal carpet production in the 20th century, um, combats between the royal hero um, and the beasts on other door jams of the hundred column tall and that's the example you see on the bottom right here. So there's a wider range here but I don't want to lump them all together, I'm merely acknowledging the, the breadth of right now 
Um, and uh, what I want to sort of emphasize today is the specificity and the kind of fine grained um, kind of differences in the enthronement scenes. I'm thinking about the way in which um, these have been presented in some very interesting literature that's al already exists on carpets, uh, on, on pictorial carpets. Um, there tends to be um, an emphasis on the provocation of carpet designers or carpet commissioners in Iran by Western sources or Western interests. So I can quote here the uh, words of Ivanov from a catalogue of an exhibition from 2007, saying that this carpet in the Hermitage reveals the interest in ancient Iranian art and history that appeared in the late 19th century, possibly as the result of European influence. I do want to acknowledge here what, that what this is showing you is a very clear citation of lithographic re reproductions of the per 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 Persepolis monuments. And this is rather different from some of the other um, reproductions of, of Achaemenid imagery that you find. There is a grisaille palette here offset by colorful borders. Um, and this is an urban production that is sort of, uh, let's say reproducing a very sort of sophisticated take on the imagery of Persepolis. We also have a significant luxury tribal production of the same image. And what I want to emphasize to you right now is just to show you the ground line in the imagery here, which shows you a dip in the representat representation of the relief. And also I want to, you to note that apart from our wing disc up here, we have a line of beasties in the, um, uh, the covering guarding the king, um, and we also have another line of beasties, but we have a wing disc, only a single wing disc in one of those layers there. And we have the same combination of features in these radically, well not radically, but quite different tribally uh, manufactured um, renditions of this scene. We have um, a dip in the ground line here, and we also have um, the wing, single wing disc uh, amid two lines of beasties. We have the, the bulls here and then lions, I think, um, and then the wing disc above. Um, in previous treatments of these, of which there have been a few, there's been a couple of articles in Harley magazine on, um, on this type of carpet, produ carpet production. Uh, this one commenting on an example owned at the time in 1987 by James O.P. Oriental Rugs, Rugs in Portland, Oregon, saying that it all are copied from 19th century French, French lithographic volumes on the Persepolis ruins, and the Kashgai versions bear the inscription Roi sur ton throne. throne. <laughs> and um, that is A, not always the case that the Kashgai versions have a French inscription, um, and you may have already noticed that, in fact, the urban um, versions um, have. French um, annotations as well. Um, so the distinction is not quite so clear, but the style and the colouring very much is. Um, in a more recent article in Harley, um, I want to give a shout out to Ben Evans's um, write-up of these um, tribal versions of the market of, of these carpets. Um, and I'm citing this to kind of disagree or revise um, his conclusions, uh, but I did want to sort of acknowledge this, these points to kind of show you that there has been discussion, sort of, you know, sensible discussion um, of these items. So Evans is, is um, proposing that um, Persepolis would inevitably appear in um, carpets produced by the Kashkai tribes because the site dominates the traditional migration routes of the nomads and therefore it's not surprising that it features on their rugs. Um, citing the earlier write-up in 1987, he notes that the rugs all have a very clear rendering under the throne of the French words throne in mirror image, um, although some of them actually have alternative French phrases, originally copied from a lithograph. Um, I don't quite follow the reasoning of, of the analysis of the image here, um, but the um, idea that it belongs to a photograph or it derives from a photograph from the French archaeologist Marcel and Jane Dolefoy is not actually true. Um, and I think what this is part of what I want to sort of address today is, is about precision in tracing imagery um, through these sort of Qajar cultural currents. Um, and as a sort of framework um, 
base point that I want to give you for that exercise, I want to cite a really wonderful recent book by Tarlin Grigor, uh, published 1920, uh, 1921, 2021, uh, Persian Revival, the Imperialism of the Copy in Iranian and Parsi Architecture. Um, and what she is trying to do in contextualizing in depth the use of neo-Achaemenid or archaizing imagery, pre-Islamic imagery, in buildings of the 19th and 20th century is to show how um, this, this revival, revivalist architecture is really part of a, a new, fresh, contextualized construction of identity and operations and everyday life, uh, religious, political identities in its 19th or 20th century context. Um, and this is about removing these words of inspiration, influence and interest here, which remove the agency from the uh, commissioners, the selectors and the manufacturers of these objects. Um, she uh, proposes, let us flip things here. Through their select selectivity, it is 19th century craftsmen and patrons who influence conceptions of ancient Iranian art history, with which I agree. Um, but she also suggests that um, the context for their production explains that there is little interest in Achaemenid and Sasanian sites before the arrival of the West, which I disagree with, as you can see from my annotations here. And I will go on to talk. Uh, Andrew mentioned the most recent article that I've produced with Moya Carey um, on uh, Safavid uh, paintings that evoke um, historic environments from the Iranian landscape. And I don't have time to do a, a massive uh, summary of that hypothesis here, but what we spent many words trying to argue in our article uh, was that there was selective reproduction, um, selective embedding of scenes and items evoking pre-Islamic antiquity in um, Timurid actually, and as well as uh, Safavid era painting in order to deploy ideas or you know, interrogate or explore ideas about pre-Islamic Iranian history. Um, my apologies, the uh, manuscript references aren't on this slide yet, but um, on the left you see um, a folio from um, the Smithsonian um, in the um, uh, now Smithsonian uh, Museum of um, uh, Islamic um, and pre-Islamic antiquities. Um, and you have a Hamsa um, manuscript showing the story of Khosrow and Shireen with a, an, a sort of relatively accurate drawn citation of Togobostan, the Sasanian arch, um, sort of inserted into the story of Farhad and Shireen in this scene on the left. Um, and then in the, on the right, a folio from Berlin, um, a Shahname manuscript which may not look particularly neo achaemenid or pre-Islamic to you, uh, but in this scene of the enthroned Chai Khosrow, uh, there are two um, grey figures supporting the um, frame, architectural frame around him, and those figures are evoking um, the um, imagery of Persepolis um, and the supporters um, supporting the throne scene um, of uh, the Achaemenid king at Persepolis. And we developed that idea with reference to other 17th century paintings there. So our point being that um, actually prior to what is quite often constructed as the arrival of the West as an influence in Iranian ideas of pre-Islamic antiquity, there is plentiful and repeated evidence for uh, constructions and interrogations of pre-Islamic antiquity in various visual and textual formats. Um, so with these examples, I will briefly, as I hope in a kind of condensed way, take you through the varieties of citation of the Achaemenid uh, throne scene, the graphic sources of these throne scenes, um, something about the circumstances for adoption, and I will sort of indicate um, that the possibility that there are particular social contexts for these adaptations and for sort of further generations of adaptations of neo-Achaemenid imagery um, and proposing that ultimately one can see this as, as a way of, of generating a historic um, construction and historic translation of the current hege hegemony um, using these pre-Islamic uh, monuments that are effectively part of um, local memory and identity. 
I want to highlight, um, and I know, again, there's probably many people in the audience who've worked on, on several of these different kinds of iterations of neo achaemenid imagery in different contexts. I want to highlight that the particular variety of um, uh, carpets that I'm looking at here actually have a different kind of throne scene to the one that we find in other media. So although lithographic reproduction is, is very influential in the graphic design of um, colourful um, Qajar era tiles um, and other media, in fact the enthronement scene that we actually find on extant um, uh, tiles and um, sculpture and the two central uh, images here that you can see are both um, examples from the British Museum collection uh, but this one here um, actually is very similar to the one visible in the Narendastan um, uh, fireplace um, a sort of late 19th century uh, mansion of Khabar Mulk Mulk um, in Shiraz um, all of these sort of architectural carved relief examples are themselves a little bit further removed on. They are a further generation away from, as it were, the um, Achaemenid relief production. So what you have here is, is a sort of far more integrated, adapted, sort of self-sufficient uh, run of imagery, even though it is, it is still um, evoking that original historic reference point in the site. And you can see the difference here between the kind of adapted, um, more informal gatherings of figures here, and the sort of strict adherence to the sort of lithograph record um, of uh, the image here. I also want to point out that, of course, these aren't always the earliest <laughs> examples we have. Um, in, in an album now held by the Metropolitan Museum in New York, um, drawings uh, by um, Ahmad Nakash of um, various reliefs at Persepolis and Naqshbandiya, um, and these these are themselves independent and different from the ones I'm showing you. So um, we have different strands and different production levels and levels of publication. Again, what we have here is this strand of imagery of Jamshid, um, a sort of condensed um, achaemenidizing um, king, um, which becomes increasingly popular um, from the 1860s onwards due to the publication of the Nomaya Khusrovan Dastani Padshahani Fars. Um, and um, this particular example also influences some car produ production, but I'm not going to talk about those now. So in terms of the line of carpet production I want to talk about, um, one of the earliest examples we have dated is from 1887, date produced in a urban context, in a Kaman elite context. Um, and this is unique in the sense that this has its own kind of uh, design creation. This is not dependent on a lithograph original. Um, this is a sort of compilation of uh, what one might um, draw from an encounter with the hundred columned hall and then kind of elaborate upon um, for the purpose of the production. I want to point out though that like the pairs of door jams at Persepolis in the hundred columned hall, um, these do exist in some cases as pairs and that seems to be what is the case um, with these two, one in Tehran and one circulating um, seemingly um, on the market uh, more recently and, and having had a rather harder life than the museum example. What you can see though is that these are a direct response to encounters with the um, site uh, because you not, not only do you not have wing disc um, but you have a sort of condensed take on an encounter with the um, uh, inscribed, the, the, the carved uh, door jam here. So you have a prestigious production, a pre prestigious urban production that might have influenced the production of these pieces um, with reference to the multiple models of um, uh, audience scenes at Persepolis. And I show you here the Hundred Column Hall again, uh, at the north side and also the central building on the right hand side. Um, so our next generation is um, the production of, um, and again, I don't have the inventory number, I apologise for the Tehran Carpet Museum, Tehran Carpet Museum example. Um, we have two of the um, sort of lithograph grisaille um, uh, iterations of the carpet here. 
both of them with French um, labels, but different ones. This one showing um, being personnage ancien um, at, at Persepoli here on the bottom. So what this suggests is that there is, the, the, that there is a model which can be slightly adjusted according to the commission of preference. And there is indeed a direct lithographic ancestor for all of these, um, all of these carpets with the same um, annotation on the bottom in French. And you can see uh, the um, gap here with the, um, uh, the, the sort of gap in the ground line um, and also the missing, um, uh, missing wing disc. Um, this is from a French publication of the 18, eight, uh, 1840s, which acted as a sort of compendium um, of um, all um, sources for imagery of ancient Persia. And these were drawn from a number of different publications, um, compiled together as a sort of album of antiquity in style and art, um, showing um, sort of every source that could be, could be obtained. This became a sort of pop popular publication um, through the 1840s, 1850s. It circulated in paperback and therefore it is quite possibly um, the most um, uh, um, available model. This was um, Dubur's L'Univers Pittoresque. It's multi-volume, it's an encyclopedic volume. I'm not sure whether this means that the entire encyclopedic volume reached Iran or was, a, or sort of was, was, part of, was being marketed to Iran, uh, but it was um, at least the kind of direct source, and you can see a very accurate direct source uh, for the carpet image here. Um, and what I'm just going to show you now is the further origins of this image. Um, so that in itself is borrowed from earlier publications. Uh, and the publication that is borrowed from, you can see on the left. And that is the publication in Robert K. Porter's uh, Travels um, in Persia, where he attempted to create a, an accurate record of the current state of Persepolis. So in copying um, the door jam um, reliefs at Persepolis, he tried to make this accurate. It wasn't completely accurate. It's actually rather a, um, uh, a combination compilation that he may have compiled away from the site. But nevertheless, he tried to strive for accuracy in showing the destruction of the king's face, um, damage to the reliefs, and also the dipping ground line. And I'm just going to highlight these in a further uh, slide here. So what you can see is these, these kind of gestures towards accuracy that he, he attempted to incorporate and which um, uh, therefore characterise or kind of give away the Keir Porter derived imagery, even though the French publication of the 1840s from which these were sourced um, does not uh, credit him. More Keir Porter um, uh, um, uh, plates um, were the source of more of these urban um, commissioned carpets, and there are two here, both of them having passed through uh, auction houses um, and other collections, so I don't really have a great deal to say about them, apart from to say that they also extract the lithograph, but self-consciously present or kind of cite the lithograph um, in their monochromatic embedding of the image in a more colourful border. I also want to point out that the prominence of Kerr Porter's imagery or Kerr Porter's uh, interpretation of the release was probably also highlighted from 1889 onwards by its use in um, Khavaji Dinshaw Kiyash's ancient Persian monuments, which used Kerr Porter as a source uh, for a lot of these, um, um, a lot of these um, uh, plates. So in terms of, um, sorry about my, my um, sort of uh, uh, incomplete um, annotations there, in terms of um, the timeline, we have the publication of Robert Caputo's image of the um, uh, uh, door jams in 1821. Um, in 1841, we actually, we have Porter's plates sampled without attribution in uh, De Boer's L'Univers uh, Pittoresque. Um, we have further 
comprehensive image productions around Persepolis in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s and 1880s, but none of those are particularly reflected in this line of production. However, we do have in 1877-78 uh, excavations centred on the 100 columned hall, which may have accentuated the imagery, have highlighted that imagery as a particularly prestigious um, set of imagery associated with the current government. We have the Narendra Stan being designed um, and constructed for Kavamol Mulk in the 1880s in Shiraz, uh, which is more or less the same time as the original farm and farmer um, um, commissioning. Um, Kiash's ancient Persian sculptures, sculptors is being uh, produced 1880s, and then there is also Western intervention in the 1880s and the 1890s um, in the form of the production of casts um, in 1892 as well. So from all of this we have a multi-centred concentration and elaboration of interest in um, the um, bas, -relief, bas reliefs at Persepolis. Not all of those are Western. Um, in this particular case, it is not the novelty of photography that is impacting this range of production. It is in fact quite an old established image, which is being cited as a particularly um, kind of authoritative relic of the site itself. Um, away from the site. And I kind of want to emphasize that idea of citing the memorial, the, the kind of past image of the site. So if we move on to the um, tribal kind of inspired versions, and this will kind of be my final couple of points, um, these Kashkai enthronement carpets clearly cite and reframe uh, the farm and farmer, the original sort of farm and farmer commission, which deployed the Dubur version of Kerr Porter's original sketch of Persepolis from 1821. Um, they retain that ground line, they re retain the variegated carved surface of Porter's original, as well as different versions of the French caption, but they fill in that sober monochrome of the urban print uh, quotations with much more varied and vibrant colours. Um, most of these carpets, and this is a selection gleaned from um, auction sites, the magazine articles I've already mentioned, plus the one on the bottom, which is in the collection of Hadi Mahtabi, who's been a, a, a brilliant person to sort of just talk to about the characteristics of these, um, this particular group of carpets. Um, most of them reproduce this beige page-like ground. Um, although there, is, there are also um, this fascinating one on the left from Christie's in 2002 has a blue ground sort of negative version with golden stone outlines. Um, there's an example dedicated to Khane Jan, which I believe is this one here, um, showing light and dark blue in the door gem frame, as well as figural profiles and shadows. Um, and in that one, red differentiates what were unshaded parts of the original print, as well as picking out highlights of the figure's clothing. So in these beige ground versions, there's blue for shaded outlines and red for light areas, staying roughly consistent, and then other colours vary. There's more yellow and green in some versions. And the, the winged figure at the top of the composition usually has multicoloured wing feathers. Um, which um, may be an intriguing point to those of you who are aware of um, the survival of polychromy on um, the surface of some of the winged figures from the hundred columned hall. So these vivid adaptations also include additions that aren't in the original carpet, uh, urban carpet production. They include rosette ornamented borders, which echo the segmentation of the relief registers at Persepolis, uh, with rows of rosettes. Um, the colorization um, and selection sort of draws and adapts that sparse lithographed image into this much more sensorily immediate way. Um, and the kind of overall of what overwhelming kind of um, impression of, of this kind of level of production, most of which seem to be dated around 1900, 1904, uh, but potentially sometimes a little bit earlier, is that um, there is a kind of reappropriation of the academic image and a translation into the more immediate authoritative, we are closer to this, this imagery. This is a kind of immediate, vibrant, living um, read on Persepolis. 
Um, I want to finish with a couple of points about the possible interpretations of this adaptation, this tribal adaptation. And one of them is based on this um, example published back um, uh, actually partly in um, 18, 1987 and um, now in 2016. Um, the, uh, one of the earlier um, carpet dates was uh, given as 1819, which Pavis Tanavoli um, interpreted as meaning that the, the carpet itself dated to 1819. Um, ironically, 1819 um, is um, the date in which the source image <laughs> was more or less created, uh, which creates a really interesting resonance. Um, but um, the other thing that is worth bearing in mind is that effectively this could also be a commemoration carpet, commemorating the origins of Kashgai power within the province of Fars and sort of linking current elevations of Kashgai chieftains um, in that the current government of the turn of the century back to um, permutations of um, their family rule in the um, early 19th century. And this is a very tentative suggestion that I want to make that is not about misreading the date and it's not about uh, creating a fake ancient carpet. It's about using these as perhaps a commemoration of the position of the family that is commissioning them. Um, I also want to note that the uh, Khavamul Mulk is obviously um, in charge of the, uh, the uh, Khamse tribes um, in the same province. You have a consistent use of this enthronement in Kashgai carpet production um, and um, not in Khamse carpet production. Um, and you also have an appropriation of these ruins uh, by Khavamul Mulk, both in the, uh, the elder and younger Khavamul Mulks. By, um, uh, in the in the Narendrastan, but also in the political social use of the ruins themselves. And this is a photograph on the lower right is from a, a recent exhibition in Leiden showing um, a German traveler hosted at Persepolis itself um, with a sort of you know late version of the original Qajar um, kind of ceremonial tent full with carpets and everything um, in front of the Palace of Darius at Persepolis. So what I want to suggest is that these more vivid um, carpets themselves are perhaps laying claim to um, an allegiance with the historicity of the site themselves um, in competition with the same kind of um, uh, appropriation going on in the centre of Shiraz by Kavamul Mulk. And I also want to note that this is not the end of the story. Um, we have later carpets produced on a similar model, uh, but I know nothing about this one. It came up for auction. I don't know where it is now, uh, but what it shows you is that there is a continuing sort of um, use of the um, authority of the audience scene um, as a sort of manifestation of governmental um, uh, allegiance, um, both in the production of stamps from 1914 onwards, in, by the way, an image modelled on Keir Porter's original uh, production, um, but also in sort of the functionaries of the administration. And the example on the right here is in Monaco. Um, and I sort of just gratefully acknowledge here um, the conversations I've had with Yulia Smick, who has been studying this, uh, the Villa, Villa Danishgar or the Villa Espahan in Monaco, which features a number of different iconographic elements of the late Qajar period. Um, but um, these show um, a, a sort of manifestation on an architectural scale. I will end there um, and open up for questions. So thank you very much for your patience. That's absolutely wonderful, Lindsay. Thank you so very much. And uh, here's one question already. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for this richly documented and thought-provoking talk. My question is about how diverse are the images of Persepolis on carpets? Some extremely rudimentary or sketchy, others reconstructing a palace in ways that we see in recent years based on highly sophisticated archeological studies. How do you account for these more complex ones, such as the carpet you showed in one of your earlier slides, uh, which was in the middle of the lower register? And as your talk proceeded, most of the carpets seem to be settled, for a, settled on a standardized image based on prints and photography. Can you elaborate on the standardization of the image? Is this the effect of commercialization or stroke souvenir value of such carpets? So a few things uh, going on there. Yeah, lots, lots to comment on. <laughs> yeah. So what I would say is that um, the one that's become the standardized image for souvenir purposes is the combat scene, which I barely showed. I just showed that in the, in the earlier compilation. 
Um, and those ones are now, now tend to be attributed to Kashgai tribal production of the mid 20th century. So you see a lot of combat scenes. Um, the enthronements, yes, there are some standardized derivations from these examples that I've shown today, but they are a little bit more special and restricted. So the ones that I've shown you that are the tribal productions, those are using a silk weft where, where, where the kind of details of the construction are given. There is a silk weft plus the wool on top, uh, the wool pile. Um, and that is a kind of an, a revision of or a kind of inflation of the cotton and wool construction of the, the urban ones. So, um, so I would say that the enthronement style, that Kerporto lithograph, yes, it definitely had a little family, but it hasn't come through to the kind of 20th century souvenir levels in which you mostly see the, com the combat style instead. Um, so we could talk about the different manifestations. I think my main overview point would be, especially alluding back to that, that, um, sorry, I'm feeling that uh, you, you, perhaps could see that if we go back to it. Um, go back to the compilation. Um, that These are all different production centers for different kinds of carpets. Um, and that each one is actually quite specific and not necessarily always borrowing from the others. Apart from in the 20th century, you just get combat scenes on, across tribal carpets all over the place. Does that, does that help a bit? Does that emphasize? I, I'm sure the questions are going to, you know, follow it up on, on an individual level if they want to pursue it. Um, it's a fascinating question and fascinating look again. Thank you for going back and, and reminding us of the slides. Uh, another comment here that you can see these images in, sil in silver work uh, as well. Uh, so that's a comment. Um, they, they are often in style. Um, quite a little bit li more like this. So there's again what i'm saying is that there's streams and so for, for a bunch of commissioners of carpets to select the lithograph image as a source is a much more of a kind of elite gesture to the other kinds of iconographic deployment does that make sense um a question here about the uh relief in monaco can you elaborate on the relief in monaco because it seems quite curious um, Yulia Smick is the person currently working on uh, the villa. Um, she, I've had, had a number of conversations with her about it. Um, it's only one of about, it's one of three reliefs on that kind of terrace that are in front of the, this, this giant villa. Um, what I would say, she is researching the family, the, the commissioning, the kind of um, the information relating to that family um, and the lives led within that structure. Um, what I would say about the use of pre-Islamic iconography in the architecture there is that it's actually quite consonant with models that you could have got by, with carpets. So in more than just that one case, there are um, it, there's imagery that he uh, he the designers could have sourced from lithographs and carpets specifically. Um, so it feels like this is a Pahlavi, uh, no, sorry, not Pahlavi, Qajar official from northern Iran, who has got some of these these elite possessions and attributes as part of that system, and has brought them out to import them and implant them in this. Um, exotic, exotic, as Monaco being exotic environment. Does that make sense as well? Uh, other questions can go to the Q and A there on Zoom. I, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative, as it were. I, I'm interested in in the Safavid dimension to this, to which you very quickly alluded when we were talking about your your earlier article, and and the the implication, or maybe it's stronger than an implication, in that article is that elements of of the shall we say the political elite were pushing particular uh, connections to the pre-Islamic period uh, in general. And I wonder if you're at the point in this research to be able to say uh, that it, in carpets or any other kinds of works, um, the court or other court parties, shall we say, if political elites were also commissioning or, and or pushing this image with a view towards making those connections to the pre-Islamic 
Iranian scene. Um, sorry, you mean in the Safavid period or? No, I'm, I'm talking about bouncing off the, uh, the article, the discussion you were having in the Safavid period. I wonder if you're able to make those same kinds of connections you're very strongly implying for the Safavid period to the Qajar period. That is the extent to which Qajar elites or other, uh, yeah, Qajar elites general, political, commercial, whatever, are also pushing that image as a way to identify the Qajars with the pre-Islamic past as well and thereby enhance I mean, that's already happened, um, in, and I sort of cite an a, a article of Susan's here um, talking about the sort of early 19th century royal evocation of um, pre-Islamic legend, what we call legendary, but basically pre-Islamic monarchy as a source of legitimacy for the Qajar monarchy. Um, so that's already happening in the early 19th century, um, the use of rock reliefs, um, the use of the sites themselves, uh, which is not just stimulated by Western visitors, but is also recorded in Qajar prose histories about interactions with, um, with, with sites, with, with tombs, etc. Um, so that's going on all the way through the 19th century. Um, what is, and I can't quite think of what the motiva motivation is here, but what's interesting um, about the the kind of the first wave of these lithograph carpets is it does start in the court it does start in the upper echelons the urban elites I guess what I'm more beguiled by and more kind of swerving into is what I'm I'm quite interested in the idea that there are multiple parties laying claim to the site using the same framework so you have the urban urban court elite but you also have the tribal hierarchy who themselves are jockeying for position and, and effectively saying, oi, this is our authority and our kind of association. Um, and that's part of the argument that Moira and I were trying to make for the Safavid period too, that although you, you have evocations of pre-Islamic antiquity being produced in Isfahan, you know, in the court, um, what might be underlying that is the fact that there's competition over, over these sites. These sites are being appropriated by multiple groups at any one time and so there are many competing interpretations and competing lines and I think that's what I would say about the multiple carpet interpretations as well these, these are all just different takes and they are not necessarily consonant or consistent with each other um, and and we should remember that they're perhaps being interpreted differently by different audiences as well. I mean, certainly in the latter part of the 19th century, the court is under a great deal of challenge, uh, you know, from peripheral, what we might term as peripheral areas. So it's very interesting to see the, the competition for legitimacy in that sense of grounding uh, claims in the pre-Islamic past. I have another question here. Uh, thank you for this wonderfully illustrated paper. The circulation and digestion of early 19th century French pre print media in Iran is impressive and directly impacts urban interiors as well. Have you spotted any other pre-Islamic monuments such as Takabustan in 19th century carpets as well? Um, there is a, so for, for a, that's an interesting one. Um, there are Farhad and Shireen carpets. <laughs> Actually, Moya, you should know, there are Farhad and Shireen carpets, um, which, which sometimes incorporate a kind of relief element. Yeah. Um, and the, so-called four seasons which are really just different scenes which sometimes use photographic sources for those scenes do include multiple monuments and include cuneiform sometimes include cuneiform as well as just the kind of the scene um, but there there is always a blend what i again is is quite relevant to our safavid ideas there's always a blend of pre-islamic and islamic so there's not necessarily a distinction between what is Islam? What is Islamic and what is not Islamic? If you see what I mean, and I think that's an important thing to remember for the nineteenth century, that these things aren't aren't in separate spheres. Um, so I, I would say there's a role for those pre-Islamic monuments, but they're part of the mix rather than there being an, the exclusive concentration. Okay, I have a couple more questions because uh, we're right at time, so we'll take those and then I think we'll maybe call it quits at that stage. A rather long question. There's a reference to Sir Mortimer Duran's report in his mission, 1894 to 1900, suggested that the British Empire should double down on its nation building strategy in Iran based on Persian identity in order to unite the country, uh, in order to serve all interests of the British Empire. So based on historical sources, the kings of Persia have been either Arabs or Mongols, 
Turks, Turkmen, Azeris, etc., since the downfall of the Sasanians, except for the Kurdish and the Zans and such. This includes Reza Shah, who was born into a mixed Turkmen and Caucasian family and who changed his surname from Khan to Pahlavi. Uh, so my question, sorry, the, the question is, why hasn't this been and still is very easy for Arabs, Mongols, Ilkhan, Zadeh, Seljuk, etc., including Qajar dynasty, uh, based on their own statements that they were Mongol, Turks, and Qashqai tribes that you mentioned as part of the Qajars, to claim that they are Persians and that their rulers are the king of kings and have even turned them into the arts. Where are these Persians who have not ruled the country since the end of the Sasanian dynasty? I'm not sure I can answer that question in full. I would say that um, the point behind this argument is to suggest that whatever your whatever your recent origin in actuality and how what how you define recent <laughs> as, as an as a in relation to origin. Um, this is a recreation of identity and memory. So whatever your origin within Fars, when you read about the Kashgai, for example, um, uh, relationships with the ruins, there is an internalization of identity related to the landscape, including those ruins and those origins. And I don't think you can um, really map that onto any larger schematic analysis of racial groups and the origins of different rulers. Um, what we see with Fars in particular is multiple groups from anywhere appropriating the site and in, but also to a certain extent internalizing the site as part of their own identity and history. And it, it's very difficult to, to suggest that or, origins of any kind really stand in the way of that. Does that make, does that, I hope that answers that question. I think we're kind of moving, you know, we're passing each other in our points. Um, in, in my a, I think question. there is a, a related question. Um, is this a kind of persophilia emerging under European influence? Because most of the political elites were Turkish origin at the moment, but, and, and they wanted to build an Iranian identity using pre-Islamic symbols. It's kind of the related question. I mean, this is arguably the same discussion that one tends to find oneself having for the Safavid period too, in that you have Isfahan being created as a brand new Brand, not brand new, but a, a renovated capital uh, with masses of new inhabitants from all over the place being moulded into a, a sort of system for Shah Abbas. Um, but that tends to happen in, in big moments of reformation in the States at every point. Um, and so you will have transplants from it within Iran and elsewhere um, who are kind of situating themselves and creating their identity in relation to the surroundings around them, including the pre-Islamic things. Um, I did try to push against the idea that this kind of mentality is a product of European influence. It seems to me to be purely one of those things that will always happen in a situation where you have hierarchies trying to define themselves in relation to how they construct the history around them, and the ruins around them are part of the ways in which they can construct history. Um, and um, so, yes, people do tend to have these discussions about whether groups who are self-consciously Turkic um, are perhaps appropriating identities or, or, or and so on, but it seems to me to be maybe not as stark as that, uh, or, or as obviously unusual or as obviously odd. Um, I think I think the rise of racialized interpretations of what can, what is considered to be Persian is perhaps much more of an external 19th century phenomenon than we think. And a colleague of mine, Reza Zia Abrahami, has written about that. Um, so I would refer you to his work. OK, one last question. Do, do, I'm not sure to which one this refers, but it says, does this scene from these sources appear on Parsi monuments and images outside of Iran? Matt, great question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was, I, I, I have been interested in looking at the Parsi um, neo-ecumenidisms neo as well. Um, and uh, Tarling Grigor has produced this great book on it. And Matt, you have also written on <laughs> neo-ecumenidisms external to Iran, and indeed external to India as well. Um, I, 
interestingly, I have not found an enthronement scene in Parsi architecture. I may be just not finding it, but I wonder whether it's because it's it's deployed in the Qajar context with specific reference to the Persian monarchy, and it's not relevant to a Parsi community themselves. However, the timing of the concentration of these images does coincide when Parsi investment in architect, neo-Achaemenid architecture is just driving that interest more generally itself. So I, I, I would say it may be related, but I haven't found that throne scene elsewhere. And if you find it outside Iran, I, other than in Monaco, um, I'd be really interested, but I haven't found it. And I, I think it's to do with the fact that it's seen as a political, a political image within Iran, I hope, I think. Great. Okay. Well, th this has been terrific, Lindsay. Thank you so very much. And I highly recommend the Safavid uh, article to everyone because it's really quite fascinating use of this uh, material in order to uh, understand a different dimension of what the Safavids uh, were all about and to remind us of the very varied topography of Iran, a sort of a social mosaic uh, of Iran at that time, uh, as well as, of course, in the Qajar period. So absolutely terrific. Thank you so very much. We're a little over, so I'm going to bring it to an end. And so with that, may I thank everybody for participating um, for Wednesday, uh, the 29th of June, and may I wish you all the best of the rest of the day. Thank you so very much. Thank you.